Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 173, Baker's Dozen. 13 short game reviews. I'm Sean, and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, working with you to make your game nights better. We record right here live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop. And it's always awesome when we can see you here live in the lobby, our chat room. So this past weekend, Sean was down here in Windsor, and while here, I taught him 13 new games or expansions. Tonight, we're going to find out what Sean thought of each of them. After that, we've got a detailed review of Drinking Quest 6-Pack, a new version of Drinking Quest that combines all the previous games into one deluxe box. What you won't hear tonight is a Bellhop's Table Talk segment, as we are going to be covering all the games we played in the main segment. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folks. First up, we've got a couple of comments on our topic of what to do when a player can't make it to game night. Patron of the show, Math Guy Dave, writes this in regards to our MIA episode. Now, one DM of mine has a side story thing where every city has a fighting coliseum, and if we were missing people needed for the main quest, we could usually go do an arena fight for gold or other rewards. Yes. Also, RPG horror stories would be fun. There is a segment Preach, who's a streamer, does about World of Warcraft guild drama that is hilarious. <laughs> Make sure to use fake names if you read horror stories, though. Well, thanks, Dave. Um, I dig the Coliseum idea. As for horror stories, I'm up for it. We could do one an episode, probably after this segment. We do our, our feedback, then that. Um, back then a horror story so to get that started we do need some horror stories so if you've got a game night horror story you think is worth sharing send it off to mo at tabletopbellhop.com as dave suggested we'll be sure to change the names to protect the guilty and the innocent now as usual anymore we got even more comments about superhero rpgs over the last couple of weeks it's just a non-ending flow of superhero game recommendations First, we have Joshua Kubli, who writes, I've grown to love a compromise between crunch and narrative flourishes. That's what I've done or tried to do in my newer games. A good example of a game that does that, I think, that's not on your list is Prowlers and Paragons. The fact that several hero system stalwarts like Mo Mike Sarbrook have jumped on the PMP train says a lot. Now, Joshua also tossed in a bit of self-promotion with for super simple super stuff, and at the risk of scummy self-promotion, may I recommend Medigene? Just a thought. Well, Prowler Paragon, Prowler, Prowlers and Paragons, as well as the Villains of Vigilantes, both come up a lot, I must admit. And I do have them in the collection, I just haven't gotten to them in any real detail yeah. yet. Uh, I have been taking time to organize my collection and build a spreadsheet, though, so we may get some more thoughts on other super RPGs coming in the future. As for Metagene, it's on the wish list now, and I never complain when people recommend me more super RPGs. Gotta collect them all. Next up, we have fan of the show Chris Groff jumping in with, for supers games, unless they're fairly tightly framed, I'll take a more narrative approach almost all the time. Marvel Heroic checks off most of the boxes. I do wish the core book came with character gen rules, and I do think it could have benefited from more examples and some better specificity in some of the areas of play. However, for the most part, I find it does what I want really well. I also have the newest Cortex system, but I haven't really sunk into that to give it the time it needs to see what I can do with it. Now, back in the day, we used to play a lot of champions, but by play, I really mean spending a lot of time making up characters than a lot less time actually gaming, because it was a beast, and despite doing some really cool stuff, we just couldn't stay invested in it. But char character generation, God, was it glorious. There was this thing where we tried to play Palladium's Heroes Unlimited, but the game was a disaster, top to bottom, so that never lasted. Big Guy's Small Mouth was okay, but it never really stuck. Silver Age Sentinels came out around the same time as Mutants and Masterminds, and between the two, I think it was the superior game. We had a lot of fun with that one for an old-school style supers game. It would still be my go-to. But again, when I want supers, I still tune to Marvel Heroic, and that will likely not happen if I'm running anything. 
leaving the original Mario RPG for last. Played a lot of it in high school and we had a blast, warts and all. We tried to play it a handful of years ago and while we enjoyed the nostalgia, we just couldn't get into the system. Felt too archaic and restrictive for us. So back to Marvel Heroic we went. Oh, and as far as Mask and some others, I can't get into PBTA games. I've tried several now and I just can't get into that system. I really dislike it. Well, there's a lot of games there and some admittedly with some notable problematic content and creators involved. There really are so many super games out there to fit every niche and need of people. And while I do totally understand the dislike to masks in particular, uh, as that sort of highly emotionally charged teen angst isn't for everyone, mm -hmm. and I have myself struggled with it. Uh, writing off all PBTA games seems a bit strong, perhaps. Well, sticking with the theme of supers, Brandon Feldman had a comment on our Marvel, Marvel Multiverse playtest review. They wrote, I enjoyed it, but it's missing the skills section. Mm -hmm. Only two or three mentions of what skills are, which makes non-combat hard. Yeah, and that pretty much matches our main concern with the game at this point. So at least he mentioned there are a couple skills that are mentioned. I don't remember you mentioning any skills being in the game at all. Well, they're all combat related. It's, 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 it's again, it's, it's, I, so far, the only skills are combat related skills. So it's, it's kind of a moot point whether or not they're, they're there or not because they would just need more combat. More combat. <laughs> well, thanks for the comment, Brandon. Now, Raphael Vega found our Chronicles of Avel review and said, Great review, guys. I really want to try this out with my seven year old daughter. Well, thanks, Raphael. That seems to be the perfect age for this game. And I hope you enjoy it as much as we have. Well, next, we have a couple of comments on our topic of great games to bring on vacation. Morgan 3 writes, I think Star Realms would fit this list as well. Tiny Box, fast playing and fantastic for two players. Or Star Realms Frontiers for the ability to play four player co-op solo mode. And now Mark Spector from Grand Gamers Guild commented, if you can take Unlock on vacation, you can certainly take my holiday hijinks escape room games. All right. Well, some good suggestions there. Um, honestly, I never think of Star Realms as portable, but that's com because I combined all my sets in one big box, so it's really not that portable anymore. But had I just had some of the original starter decks on their own, it's a great suggestion. Now, as for Mark's suggestion, head over to Green Gamers Guild and check these games out. Um, we've known about these for a while. They were on our print and play game list because they were originally released as print and plays, but you can get that still or physical copies. Now he's got three different ones so far. Uh, one I'm not too interested in because it's Independence Day and we're not American. But for the rest of us in the world, you do have Halloween and Valentine's Day. And there is a bundle where you can get all three. Well, next we have Brian Thompson who commented on our Sorcerer review. Motu's new, read your review last night, gave me all I needed. It's more adult than my son is ready for. So mm -hmm. since he's my main gaming partner for a lot of games these days, I'll have to hold on this. Too bad for now. We both enjoy playing Magic now and then. Well, thanks for the comment, Brian. And I gotta say, I was actually shocked by just how dark the content in Sorcerer is. I, it was a complete surprise to me. Like, I sat down at Origins with Rob, and he started teaching me this game, and I'm looking at the art, and I'm like, wow, okay. Um, I'm, I'm still kind of surprised. Like, I wonder what made them go with such a brutal... A gory setting for the game with just like creepy themes like i actually can't help but wonder if that impacted sales i know for me personally i didn't keep up with the game and one of the reasons was the over-the-top artwork fair well let's finish off with an extremely positive comment left on our tales from the loop board game review sneths says the style of your reviews is absolutely the best well thanks sneths well, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. We do have one announcement before we move on to our main topic tonight. So this is your last chance to save on one of our all-time favorite games. Our Gorinto offer ends tonight for those of you listening when this show drops on May 31st. For those of you here live, you got a bit more time to save. For the entire month of May, you can get the Kickstarter edition of Gorinto for $5 off and receive the five-player expansion completely free. Now, to take advantage of this offer, you just have to head over to Grand Gamers Guild with grandgamersguild.com, 
Add a copy of the Kickstarter edition of Garinto to your cart and type in the code BELLHOP, all caps, one word on the checkout page. Or click the link in the show notes or our chat room where the game will automatically be added to your cart, cart and the discount applied. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. So tonight, I've got a question for Sean. Uh, what'd you think of the 13 new-to-you games I taught you this past weekend? That's right. I was down in Windsor for the May 2-4 weekend, and while down there, in addition to some great food and company, I got in 15 gameplays, 13 of which were new-to-me game experiences. And actually, nice. I believe I'm wrong. I haven't double-checked, but I may actually be 17 because I did play that one game solo twice. Oh, that's true. Uh, now, this included 11 brand new games, as well as two games I am familiar with, but with expansions I'd never tried. So what we're going to do tonight is let Sean provide us with a short review of each game, sharing his thoughts after I give a brief introduction to each of them, including some of my thoughts on each game first. Now, this wasn't the sort of hardcore nose to the grindstone sort of gaming we have done in the past at SeanCon and such. This was a bit more relaxed as we had a holiday weekend to enjoy with beautiful weather, as well as yes. some games to play. Yeah, no 13 plays of one game over three days this time <laughs> around. We didn't completely burn ourselves out on one game. And yes, I thought of calling this another Sean Con, but Deanna hates when I use the term Sean Con because no one will Google for Sean Con, and it's terrible for SEO. But for all intents and purposes, this is Sean Con 2020 number two. <laughs> so the first game we played was a four-player game of Shadow Kingdoms of Laria with Sean, Tori, and Kat. Now, this is one I've enjoyed since we got to preview it back in 2020. I got to check out a prototype of it, and I really enjoyed it. I still enjoy this every play. I just find there's something elegant about the dice placement mechanic and the, the engine building in this game. Though I do still wish the evil forces featured more asymmetry between them. Now, what do you think of Shadow Kingdoms as a Valeria fan? You know what? I, I was, it's shocking, actually, that this is the first time I have played it because it's been around for a while and it just hasn't gotten to the table. But as with any Valeria game I've tried, I really enjoyed this. Now, while it does have a notably different feel than the earlier oh, yeah. Valeria game, there's still enough theme and dice goodness combined with their art style to make it feel as part of the world. Now, while I agree a bit more asymmetry could be beneficial, we have seen enough times lately where it's gone wrong that I don't necessarily blame them for backing off to keep it balanced and avoid the needless complication of trying to balance various factions and make sure one isn't OP. Now, this is the same company that put out Horizons and Horizons launched as a 4X game that was missing one of the X's. So what I want to see is Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria asymmetry. <laughs> And I'll be really happy about that. Now, what I do have is I have an entire box of expansions for this with, I think, like five different modules. We need to try those at some point because I haven't tried any of those. But that'll have to wait for another trip. Yeah, I'd completely forgotten that there was just so much more to it than just the base game that they put out during that Kickstarter. Uh, and those all came with uh, with that base game when you got the Kickstarter edition uh, yes. for the preview and all that. Yeah, my version did come with the expansion, but it is available standalone. Actually, they, when they packaged it, it literally came in a separate box and it was shrink wrapped separate and everything. So I, I think, did we do an unboxing of that? I think we did an unboxing sure separate did, of that. Yeah. So I think you can even check out what you get in it to see what we haven't played with yet. <laughs> I did look through it after we played the first game and I was tempted, but we didn't get to it this weekend. So next up was a four player game of Drinking Quest, uh, specifically to check out the Drinking Quest six pack deluxe box set. Uh, this is a box set we're going to review later in the show, so I don't want to say too much about it right now, but what do you think of this mashup of card game with light RPG elements and drinking game? It was fun with the group we were playing with, but I also can't say it's a game that I would ever ask to play. Mm -hmm. And given that I'm not a drinker, if a group was going to sit down and play it, I would probably sit off on the uh, sit off and watch the group play rather than take part, even though there are absolutely non-alcoholic rules available in the game. I could see you enjoying the GM role with the, the designated GM version where you actually play five players and you're just the one that reads the cards to everyone to give them their options. Yeah. I could see you doing that, but that's about it. Next up, Space Base hit the table, and we played with six players using the new rules in the Command Station box set. That's uh, the 
I don't know if, know if you can even call it the latest expansion because I'm not sure if the new Saga expansions are. Mm. It, it's the latest expansion I own. Uh, personally, I was happy to get this off the pile of shame. It's been there since Christmas. And at the same time, get the game repackaged into its new box. So everything's now in one place and nice and organized. Now, what I haven't done is actually taken the time to sleeve the cards. I don't even know if I ever will. Um, though the one thing I did realize with this game is I bet just sleeved cards are easier to talk, so it might be worth doing. Now, as for what you get in Command Station, the new rules for the for six and seven player games, I actually enjoyed, especially the new, excuse me, especially the new seven and eight cards that everyone starts with. These let you roll white dice or go shopping on someone else's turn once you charge them up. Now, for you, this was also your first time seeing the mining rules from Shy Pluto as well as the command station rules. What'd you think of these? So this was a lot of new stuff to take in compared to just playing quick start normal game rules mm. uh, previously. Now, that being said, the iconography was consistent so there was nothing really difficult other than not knowing the cards, which yeah. does make it harder to figure out what direction other players might be going in or what I should worry about. Still, I think Lovers of Space Base, the base game, don't really find anything new to turn them off the game in this new form and with this new expansion, just more of it to love. The one thing I'm still not sure of is I find the new cards water down the deck and there's less victory point cards which ends up drawing the game out and greatly rewards the people who do get those victory point cards. Now, maybe it's just a matter of adapting my strategy, but it just, the more I play with all of the stuff in, so it's the command station and all the shy Pluto cards. It just seems like, like the deck is less smooth or le less balanced. Interesting. Okay. I get, but with only one real full will play of that, it's yeah. hard to, it's hard to really say. That's true. Now, the other thing you obviously wouldn't have seen is the mining rules, which I've mentioned multiple times on the show, and I still haven't decided exactly where I sit, though generally we just leave them in now. What do you think of the purple dice that give you a chance to get stuff on everyone else's turn? So I guess I'm sort of ambivalent to them, and I, which is sort of, I guess, where you've been a lot of the time. Yeah. Uh, you know, they were neat, and they added another mechanic, but the odds on them are so poor that they don't really have a huge impact unless you go all in on them, and which is a big risk. Yeah. So, I, I mean, at this point, based on what I saw that game, I wouldn't see any purpose in taking them out, especially not with the effort you'd have to go through to pull out all the cards related to them. Yeah. So they are marked fairly well, so they're fairly quick to take out. But at this point, I just plan on playing Space Base with it in because it doesn't bother me. Yep. And I got to say, my, my oldest daughter, Gwen, was playing with us, and she got a lot of stuff off those dice. She did. I, I mean, she, and she, but she went well, pretty much all in. I mean, she yes. had six or seven of them, I think, by the, by the end of the game. So mm -hmm. she was taking a real risk. We finished up the first night of gaming with a game of Terror Below, which I think we started a little too late in the night. <laughs> this is meant to be a fast, furious, kind of silly take that game. And I think we might have been a bit burnt out at that point. Now, I still enjoyed it, and I think this game shows promise, but I think this needs to go on the list to give another shot the next time you're down. Yeah, this is a fun one, but I agree. A bit more remaining brain power might have made things go smoother. Uh, I have to say I'm still not clear on why and how the distraction mechanic works the way it does. Now, I'm blaming that one on game or burnout rather than the rules. Um, I, I think they're pretty clear, and they seem to make sense to everyone else, but as a new concept, it just wasn't sinking in. Now, what do you think of the silly theme on this one? And I got to say the components, because I really dig, like, the concept of the game, what you're doing, the theme, and those components, to me, put it above where it probably would be if it was just an abstract pickup and delivery game. Yeah, I mean, Tremors is a classic of a movie, and this game goes all in on it, uh, even if they have filed off the serial numbers. Uh, this is definitely a fun game, though I have to say I question its replayability for most groups, um, I don't know that it's got enough depth to, to be one that really keeps coming back to the table. You know, I could see sort of binging it uh, one night and then, you know, putting it on the shelf and maybe forgetting about it a little bit because it's fun, but not engaging enough to really want to play it all the time. Fair enough. I, I think it's one that um, if there were local gaming events, it's the kind of thing you'd bring out because it's pretty quick to teach and silly and kind of fun. And it, I think it would get more play because it'd be like, oh, you haven't seen... I almost called it Tremors. <laughs> you haven't seen Terror Below yet? Come try Terror Below. Check out these awesome little egg miniatures. Yeah, no, it's got definitely got some real table presence. Uh, it's a shame about that one miniature, but it, it was amusing. Well, no, that, 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 that's because I got a demo copy of the right. game. 
That's the only reason. I doubt anyone else has that problem with the one in nature. I don't even blame the publisher on that one. I literally have the demo copies from their first con that they brought it to. So I can't blame the, the production issues. They were probably prototypes at the time. And some of my vehicles have different paint jobs on each side because I think they were probably doing an A-B testing at the time. Right. What do you think looks cooler? Now, kind of like the last time or two times ago, even the last time when Sean was down and we tried to fit in a whole bunch of Draconis Invasion, we had something similar planned for this weekend. This time it was to check out a preview copy of a game called Hellbringer, um, coming from a designer out of Montreal, Quebec. Uh, this is a card-driven roguelike dungeon crawler inspired by hack and slash video games like Diablo. We spent the first half of Saturday playing multiple rounds of different player accounts. Now, of course, the biggest issue here was that we were playing a prototype that was obviously not finished, and the fact the game was written in French, and despite the fact someone is translated, is credited as translating, it feels like it was put through Google Translate. Yeah, so right off the bat, the rulebook is not ready for release. While it may contain all the information that often, if we were talking to the designer, they could point out in the rulebook where things were, its layout and its way of presenting things combined with translation issues mean that it is a struggle to learn how to play the game. I, I would say almost impossible to really learn from the book as it stands in the English. Maybe, maybe the French book is perfectly fine. We didn't see that. We just saw the French copy of it. Um, Ignoring the fact that it took like watching a how to play video, which I got to admit, if you go to Hell, Hellbringer, I'm doing terrible on names today. <laughs> Hellbringer.com, I think is all it is. You can watch the designer play the game and you can tell he's played it a thousand times because he's playing on a tabletop simulator and talking and moving a little too quickly. And he likes to move his mouse around a lot, which can get a little annoying, but it'll actually teach you how the game plays. So I did watch that. And thankfully, this is one of those awesome times when the publisher is right there basically on call. And the designer was there uh, willing to chat on Facebook. So I ha basically had Messenger open and had a direct line to the designer while we played. So because of this, we were able to actually play the game. And I got to say, once we were able to do this, I found there was quite a bit to like here. Like the game definitely shows promise. I agree. While there are some aspects that may need tweaking, there really is a game there. And I think the timing aspect is one uh, part that I will call out as being well done. This is another one uh, similar to Draconis with their fear mechanic where they've built their own timing system into the cards mm -hmm. uh, and it works out pretty well, actually. Yeah, so in this, um, we've got someone in the chat that actually is interested in this. So we'll get into a little detail of how to play. Just a brief overview. So basically you're building a deck out of cards and you have multiple layers and you are going on your Diablo journey i can't remember the name but you like start in the crypt and then you go to the cave then you go to hell and eventually you get to the tomb of the boss and you have to fight the boss and this is all represented by cards and what it is is every card in the deck represents a deeper exploration of the dungeon so there's a neat balancing thing so the timing thing sean's talking about is the more cards you draw the deeper you get and you may not want to go too deep too quick so there's an interesting timing mechanic there Absolutely. Yeah, no, they've really they've really kind of done that well. And it's a nice sort of mingling of shuffle. Uh, I think you will find what well, what about all those other cards, but you'll yeah. uh, you'll get to them on the next play. That's the big ticket. Yeah, there is just one deck you work from one set of common cards, which is quite thick. You'll, you'll eventually probably get to see them all. What I did like is how different every game played because of that. Mm -hmm. And the way it's done is there's a couple keyword cards that are in there that when they come up, it triggers events in the game. And again, this is not a full review, so I don't want to get into full details. Um, but there's some neat stuff there. The other thing that we thought was pretty cool is that that felt weird was um, the. Sorry, I'm jumping ahead here for a second. <laughs> so the other aspect is the line of sight. Uh, so they've integrated uh, something that I've not seen in a game that handles it in this manner, uh, and it worked really well. Yeah, the designer's really proud of this. He, he calls it the line of sight rules, though, I don't know, they're kind of like a darkness rule. They kind of remind me of the rules for Massive Darkness, the miniature game. Uh, basically, everyone has a stat for how far they can see, and every monster has a stat for how hard they are to see, and you use a board to separate it out. So, like, everyone can see this monster, some of the party can see this monster, and no one can see these monsters. And that's pretty much the only board there is in the game besides these player boards where you put your equipment cards. And it's kind of cool because... As you get deeper in the dungeon, you can find things like torches that will let you see further. But as you get deeper in the deck, the dungeon gets darker. 
So it actually becomes harder to see the monsters when they come out, which I thought was kind of neat. The other thing I really liked about this was the way leveling up worked. And this was what really gave the Diablo feel to me was you were going to fight through waves of monsters and kill quite a few of them. And every time you do, you take its card and you slot it on your character sheet, giving you more uh, what a line of sight, more health, more armor, more skills or more action points. And I might be missing one there. Yeah, the leveling worked and certainly gave you some real choices about how to craft your character and how your character grew as you could easily not get cards that benefited from the advances that you'd chosen to take with your XP. Uh, and, and, you know, you had to balance that. At some points, though, it was pretty obviously what you needed yes. to improve, uh, especially often based on the scenario or just how badly things had been going for you along the way. Yeah, one of the things you're always fighting for at the beginning is action points. So you have to spend these action points to use the cards, and a bunch of the cards are very high cost, and a bunch of the characters start with one or two action points. So you're going to want to level that up pretty quick. Overall, it's a pretty neat game so far. It has a lot of, of good stuff going on, but, man, they need to clean up that rule book uh, quite a bit. The, the big thing that we haven't mentioned here at all is player count. This is a solo game that they added some multiplayer rules to it very much feels that way i think someone decided they like told them you're not going to be able to sell a solo game so they're like all right we're going to put in rules for two or three players and i know you found the same that's a solo game you played a couple times on your own you seem to enjoy that more than the group game yeah the the again i was having a little bit of trouble because i hadn't done watched the video i was trying i did especially the first time try to just sit down with the manual yeah. and learn it um that was a mistake but it was it was interesting and it was a you know intriguing game. And then when I sat down again um, early in the morning before breakfast on Sunday, uh, I tried it again solo. Uh, or was that Monday? I don't even remember now. But uh, you know, <laughs> the, one, Monday. the one morning I sat down and tried it again have, after having played it a few times uh, and more familiar with the rules and easier to set things up. Uh, and and I actually had I you know I had a, a good run on the dungeon. Uh, it was an enjoyable run. Uh, you know, again, allowing for some of the uh, the issues that we found in the game. So we do have another question from the chat room. Does the deck reset every game or do you level up? Uh, this is a, a replay. It's, yeah. it's, it's a roguelite. Yeah, it, no, that, there's, that there's, no long right. term, there's no long term uh, growth or anything. I mean, no. they could put in campaign modes, I'm sure. That could easily be expansions in the future. But they're still nailing down the, the, uh, the base gameplay right now. Yeah, this is very much a roguelike, and I think it does a good job of feeling like a roguelike. It's pick a character, you get a starting hand card, you draw cards, you build the dungeon, you get as deep as you can. Like, like compared to most other roguelikes, this most feels like Rogue, the original one to me, than most others. Because the monsters, you could get the whole thing where a dragon shows up on level one, which you don't get in most of these other games that are that side. It, to me, it feels more like Rogue than Diablo. That's fair. Um, so we did play this again. We played it on uh, the holiday Monday. We did give it another shot. Sean played a solo and then we played three players. Uh, we were still running into rules confusion, but it did smooth play smoother. And I gotta say that experience was better than the first, in my opinion. And the game does have a lot of problems. Now I need to try it solo. So once I do try it solo, we'll probably review the game, which is probably going to be next Wednesday when you'll be able to find out more. Yeah, so I would say, well, there's a lot of promise. I'm concerned that designer just hasn't done enough blind playtesting mm. to grasp the problems in their system. We noticed a lot of issues. The group who've been playing it since it was first conceived might well not notice. Yeah. So with a lot of potential in it, this game is still not ready to release to the public in its current state. Yeah, I got this, the, the whole I placed it with my friends and my friends loved it vibe or I only place tested with groups where I taught everyone how to play because there's a big difference trying to learn from the rule book and trying to learn from the designer themselves. Um, like I said, that's basically how we played. We had an open chat window with the designer when we did it. Yeah, absolutely. I tried to teach myself on that Saturday morning and it was just me and the rule book. I don't even, you didn't even know I, you didn't even know I was cracking open the game as you yep. uh, shared some deals and I played a game but in hindsight, I don't think I played the designer's no. game because, again, I hadn't watched the playthrough. So I, there were things that just didn't make sense. And, and grammatically, I had followed the letter of the of the rule book. And that was not 
the way to do it. <laughs> yeah, I came down. And I'm like, no, no, that's not how you do it. No, that's not. He's like, but in the book it says this. I'm like, look, I have watched the video from the designer. <laughs> but it I know said, how it's supposed to play. But it said. Yeah. yeah. I'm just hoping. Uh, I think this one's coming to Kickstarter. I don't have the, the details in front of me, but I, I'm hoping some of this gets cleaned up. Um, I do know that we pointed out multiple issues that they are planning on fixing. And they didn't realize the translation was a problem. We were the first people to complain, but I have a feeling we might be the first English people to play. So that could be it. All right, enough about Halbringer now. Full review coming in the next couple of weeks, possibly as early as next week. So since we played Hellbringer, and it's supposed to be a Diablo game, I decided Sean needed to try Sanctum from CGE because this is another board game that claims to be Diablo in a box. Now, what I found interesting here was how it captures different parts of Diablo than Hellbringer did. Now, I really enjoy Sanctum. It's a dice game that's all about mitigating the randomness of the dice. Kill hordes of baddies, each of which turns into a different piece of equipment, and then you need to figure out how to optimize that equipment along with what skills you want to level up, and it's really it's kind of this big Euro engine builder for the big boss fight. It's really solid but it just misses that whole fast, furious, button mashing, I'm swarmed by enemies feel of Diablo. It never actually feels tense to me until that final boss battle. What do you think of Sanctum? Now, I've heard about this one many times, and we reviewed it here, so it, it honestly felt familiar when we set it up. Uh, yep. It's definitely, uh, you know, that giving you that Diablo with the serial numbers filed off in many of its ways, but also as a rather typical Euro, it lacks any feel of a group experience. Yeah. Uh, in its current form, uh, it wouldn't transition well to a co-op. So I don't know what I would do to fix it, even if that was a, a thing you ever wanted to do. Uh, but without anything like that, it was a fun experience. Yeah, this one's funny because I have heard other podcasters talk about this as if it's a cooperative game, but it's not in any way. Not There's not even optional cooperative or maybe on the internet. In the box, there are no optional cooperative rules. Like, I think people just hear Diablo with the numbers filed off. They read the rules for the game where you're drafting monsters and only fighting your own monsters and think it's a cooperative game. But it's not. It's literally multiplayer solitaire so much that people don't even realize they're playing a competitive game. Like, that's all I can think of having. Like, these are big name podcasters that are like, yeah, I just wish the co-op element was stronger. I'm like, but it's not a co-op game. <laughs> So what I did is I always make sure when I'm teaching the game to start, and that's usually the first thing I say, despite what it looks like, this is not a cooperative game. We are each trying to win, and we do that by beating the big boss. And whoever can beat the beat the beat down the big boss the furthest or defeat him with the less most health left is who wins. So I think it's important that you do have to point that out. Now, one of the things I do really like about this game is the the um asymmetric C asymmetric nature, asymmetry, there's the word I was looking for, of the character classes. Because the, the four characters in this have completely different skills, which the equipment you get is randomized and it's all mixed up, but you're going to end up equipping your character certain ways based on that character class, even though the, the, the equipment pool is a random mash of stuff, very Diablo-like. I really wish this is a game that, that had an expansion. Like, just sell me a player board with a set of cards that I can buy in a little, you know, $10, $15 pack, and I'd be really happy. Yeah, indeed. It would be dead simple to add new character classes to this game, and it's not like Diablo hasn't added additional character classes in its history. <laughs> Where's my necromancer? <laughs> let me, let me. I don't know, summon monsters somehow. I don't even know. Take, take the monsters that are still on the board and somehow make them work for me as dice with the numbers that are already on. See, I've, I've half designed the necromancer for you already, CG. So ignoring rulebook issues, Assuming Hellbringer is, is, as we were playing at the end, the final state of the game, what do you think is the better Diablo games? So I think Sanctum it, or Hellbringer? I think if it gets cleaned up, Hellbringer is probably my choice. Um, the solo experience of it is very strong, and the cooperative group experience feels like a party actually working together. Now which that's true. gives you that feeling that's a little bit more Diablo than the, the competitive of uh, Sanctum. See, to me, Sanctum's Diablo 1, Hellbringer's Diablo 2. <laughs> I think that's what the two differences are. I do have to admit that the once we figured it out, the cooperative rules of trading items, despite having a, a thematic dumbness, I guess we'll call it, worked way better. And we played way better cooperative after the first game. Whereas Sanctum's not cooperative. Stop trying to make it cooperative. 
All right, next up, moving away from Diablo clones, we touched on Alien Frontiers. Uh, this is one of our favorite dice placement games and actually one of Deanna's favorite games of all time. She was really excited to play this one, just to even get it off the table. Now, for this play, I took out all the expansions because I have a mix of them. I don't own all of them, but I have a mix of them. And we played with just the base game, which is still fantastic. There's just something about this game that feels very elegant and pure when you play with just the core rules. Yeah, there's still plenty of options. There's places on the board to go. There's ways you can hurt each other, and there's the, the text you can build. But really, it all boils down to a really basic area majority game. And that's all you're actually worrying about. And all the rest is just to be better and do better at that area majority game. Now, I really dig Alien Frontiers. And this was a good reminder to me that we need to play this one more often. Like, we got I don't even know if Tori and Kat have ever played this game. Yeah, this one, I think we had a ball. Uh, I think it is in part, though, because of how much Dicey Dungeons I've been playing at home. Uh, Dice placement is something I have been playing a lot of in PC games between Dicey Dungeons and One Deck Dungeon and, you know, games like that. I can definitely see sitting down to this anytime it was offered. Uh, and while at first uh, the early scoring seemed like it was just kind of follow the leader, uh, it certainly did break out early on and became far more of what I was expecting and, and giving you that that back and forth uh, exciting scoring uh, aspects. Yeah, the big ones, I need you to play this one some more because one of the things that I find with this game is once you learn the tech deck, like Horizon I was talking about earlier, or Eminent Domain, once you learn what cards are out there, that can really change the flow of the game. And it's part of why I like playing with just the base game is because there's a, the distribution is nice. There are three copies of certain cards that let you mitigate your dice up or down one, you know, stuff like that. So this is one we're going to have to remember to play again next time you're down. Plus, I don't think Deanna is ever going to say no. Plus, I'll let you try the factions expansions to see what you think of it. I know I'm not a huge fan, but if we ever do play with five players, we got to throw them in. Welcome, Trashorama. Long time and no see. Yeah, and I mean, I already like it, so I can't imagine it getting worse with more plays and more content. So this game of Alien Frontiers was followed by a game of Quacks with Herb Witches. Now, my youngest daughter joined us for this one, and everyone had a lot of fun, as always, with Quacks. Uh, Deanna is now finally sold on it. She just, she's not going to recommend the game, but she'll play it. Um, now, what I did do for this game is make sure that every ingredient recipe was one we hadn't used before. And I had to say that led to some very, very odd combinations. Um, Genevieve ended up kicking our butts with a combo of raven skulls and pumpkins that was kind of ridiculous. And I'm like, man, she picked up on that right away and kind of went all in. Um, now you play Quacks before, but this is your first experience with Herb Witches. What do you think of the game with the expansion? You know, still a fun game, and I do still strongly dislike the bags that come with the base game. Uh, <laughs> the randomness is frustrating to be sure, but because it impacts everyone equally, so long as the group doesn't mind, it's all in good fun. And it's and you know, it you just have to not have that one player who's hates on everything random. Well, yes, they shouldn't be queen quacks. If you got that player, that's not the game for them. You know, I've, I've now played the game enough. I ignore the bags. Like, I, that, that, I guess they don't bother me. It's just, it's it's part of the game now for me. But yeah, getting new bags is probably on the list. The, the upgrades still are tempting me, but they're so expensive. They I could are. get another game for that price. Yep. And man, you and I had terrible luck with our pool, pulls. Like, like, I have never exploded so much in a game of Quacks, especially exploded when there's no reason I should have. Like, one in 13 chance to pull out this three. What do I pull? The three. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the whites just leapt into my fingers every time. Yes. I... <laughs> and we started with the first round. We had the um, fortune teller that removes a chip yep. at the beginning of the game. So everyone should shouldn't be exploding as much. But anyway. Now, I know you enjoyed it. What I want to know is specifically Herb Witches. What do you think, like the local weed, um, the new ingredient books, then the rule-breaking witches, the three witches? Uh, oh, and honestly, the overflow pot, too, actually, is something well, else. Honestly, I didn't get enough cash to buy big pumpkins. Yeah. Uh, I didn't trust my pulls enough to buy local weed. <laughs> and additionally, since I haven't actually played the games that many times in its base form, I honestly couldn't have told you if those books were part of the base game or not. All right, fair. Uh, the witches, however, were a handy mechanic, and honestly, if I hadn't used one of them, I would have been even worse off, as it allowed me to get those, uh, pull those six uh, uh, six to tokens at the beginning and, and preset my uh, initial 
start. So uh, that was my one good round, I guess. Yes. Uh, I'd need to play more games, I think, to have a, a strong opinion about any of those aspects. But I mean, nothing stuck out to me as a, oh my God, I can't believe they added that sort of right. thing. It, it all just kind of worked and, and added to what was already a fun game without uh, breaking anything. I think it was also the first time you used the backs of the boards. Did you have an opinion on those? Um, I should have used them more, I think is probably yeah. my opinion. I, I still haven't decided on that one. The whole, when you thicken your pot, you can, or sorry, when you, when you get a water drop, you thicken your pot or you move across. And I don't know, again, Deanna and my daughter scored a ton of points using that. And I, to me, I did it now and then. Right. So yeah, so far quacks, uh, just pick up herb, which is like, I, to me, it's a must have. I, I don't see a reason not to for sure. But I, I, it does do a couple things that help balance it. As Sean said, he, the, his best round was one time he got to use a witch to help things out. So I strongly recommend it. I think there could be arguments about the six pumpkins, but then everyone seems to love the six pumpkins. So I, I don't know. Again, it's one of those things I need to see see more yeah. often. Uh, they, they definitely weren't this, green, they game did, breaking this game. No, absolutely not. Like the people who bought them paid a lot for them and they got a bit of a benefit out of it. Not like the person with the most pumpkins won this time. So that's yeah. always good to see. So Saturday night ended up with a three-player game of Ex Libris, myself, Deanna, and Sean. I'm still really digging this one. And what I'm starting to appreciate is now that I've taught it a couple times is how easy it is to teach. Though, do make sure to explain how the shelves work with the alphabet. To me, it made sense, but it just make sure you're clear on the top to bottom, left to right, how many shelves you can have and where they can be placed. I was a little lax in my explanation of that, and I do apologize. Now, while the game was fun, I'm starting to see an issue with the balance between the various assistant powers. Now, I mentioned this the last time I was talking about this game, the, about the game, about Ex Libris, and I saw it again in this game. In particular, the trash golem seemed ridiculously overpowered, letting Deanna get free cards she could shelve at the end of every round. She got so many extra cards. Now, previous games, we noticed similar problems with the wizard who could rearrange the shelves. Now, over all my plays so far, the gelatinous cube seems useless. And Sean, that's what you ended up stuck with. So how'd you like the game, despite the fact you had what I seem to think is an underpowered faction? So this was this one was interesting because um, I had been looking forward to it. I thought the theme of this sounded great. I really wanted mm. to play. Uh, and I made some dumb mistakes early on that severely impacted my odds. Uh, but I agree that the assistants do seem to really kind of shift the game. Uh, I have to play it more to see if there are ways to mitigate that. Uh, as without be, the being a ways to mitigate, that could be a real detriment to the game. Yeah, it's making me wonder, like, I, were the Kickstarter add-ons maybe? Like, it kind of feels like, like, the game, there's so many in the box. I wonder if the game was, like, done and they threw in extras and didn't do as much play testing. Now, I have to assume Board Game Geek, someone on Board Game Geeks put a better together a list of the mix best mix right like the best assistance or just don't play with these three like pull the wizard out of the box and don't use it or only use the wizard when you're against the golem or something like that i have to assume there's got to be something out there to try to keep things balanced i, I need the stone mire you know the tapestry civilization <laughs> fix where's that for ex Libris? no i dug into the forums in the uh today and there is actually a lot of discussion but it's primarily about the golem and the bookworm being the strongest assistance. But between locations, which come out in a random uh, order, uh, yeah. which are more or less valuable, depending on your assistant, uh, or just simply working to block them, knowing that the golem is going to try and do its power at the end of the turn yeah. and be in a specific spot in order to maximize that, um, it's not completely overwhelming. You just have to play for the fact that that assistant is in the game. Mm. Um, and knowing that I would probably play differently again the next time, like the worst, uh, the worst case scenario, if nobody does anything against it and the, and all the cards come up correctly, the golem can actually place eight extra yeah. bookshelves. Ridiculous. But everyone knows, but if you go in knowing that, then the person who picks the, the golem is going to get stomped on <laughs> so that they can't do that. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I never appreciate when a game forced me to take an action I don't want to take. Where where I want to do this, but I can't because instead I have to do this to stop you. Uh, to, to me, I, I don't generally enjoy games that do that. 
Um, especially not a game like this. Like this isn't a food chain magnet, right? This isn't an 18 XX game. That's the kind of move you expect in those heavier games. This doesn't seem heavy enough to, to have to mitigate my play based on what factions are in play, but I could, I, I guess like if it's once or twice, like if now and then, Oh, I'm going to block your golem. That's fine. But if it's like, I now need to play stop the golem, the game instead of play my own game, of X Libras. Well, and again, it depends on what order the rooms come up, right? If the rooms yeah. that if the rooms that don't have those cards on sitting on them aren't there, then the golem can't do its thing. True. In our game, I uh, was every other card I think had cards. Sitting yeah. On no, it. absolutely. It was it was definitely a golem uh, beneficial draw. <laughs> and the bookworm I've never even played with yet, so that hasn't even come up. So we we'll go. wait to see how bad that one is. <laughs> Anyone talking about the gelatinous cube being underpowered? I, I didn't I didn't notice that. No. Uh but I also I, I did not use it well. So I, I think I could have made a better showing with gelatinous cube gelatinous cube if I had paid more attention. I it needs to get out first. I need to not yeah. put the gnomes out first. The cube has to hit the board first. The whole thing with the cube is is it's very clear that once it's out, if I go there, you benefit. So everyone just avoids where you are, <laughs> which I guess is a good way to counter the golem. But well, I just exactly. found any time it comes move. out. Yeah, it's a blocking move as much as it is yeah. a trying to get more move. Get more stuff out of it. Yep. The ghost seemed a little overpowered when I played it too. Anyway, enough about x Libras. Now we move on to Sunday. Uh, this started with us heading out for breakfast and ended up with an afternoon out in Essex County. While this involved some great food, it also gave us a chance to take Sean to the Banded Goose Brewery and teach him to play Racco. Although perhaps calling it a teach is a bit of a stretch. If you've learned to count and played any card game in your life, you're probably good to play. Now, that being said, it's a great game to chill out on a patio and relax with. Uh, I, I, I'm now sold. I'm, I'm now a Racco fan. And, and specifically, you got to go to Banded Goose. You got to play the copy there. Though the rule book's now missing. So the rule book I had that didn't seem to explain that you get 25 bonus points for a rack was there. I'm not there. And it is very much a bar copy. You are going to know which card is the number three pretty quickly. Although uh, if you're careful, you put it in upside down and you don't notice. It. There you go. I keep thinking I'm going to bring some white glue with me next time and like <laughs> fix up their copy or my laminator and just like totally relaminate the cards. But yeah, we actually had a, had a lot of fun sitting around uh, playing some rack. Sean got to discover a new cider he really likes and Dan and I had a pint of beer. That was enjoyable. All right, next up, the biggest, biggest in every way possible, uh, weight, physical size, gameplay length, everything together, the most epic endeavor of the weekend. When we got home Sunday, we were, I was itching to play something a bit meatier, and I know Dan has been kind of pushing to play something with a bit more meat and something longer than the other games we played. Like most of what we played were like one to two hour games, and I thought Anachrony would be a great pick. The problem was that my copy of Anachrony was still spread over three different boxes. Because, see, I kickstarted the Infinity box and the two new expansions back in 2020 and never actually took the time to sit down and sort everything out, punch the new content, and get everything put into the, I think it's game trays, but if it's not game trays, sorry, whoever designed the trays, they're great, and get everything in its trays and not necessarily in the box, but at least organized. And that's how this epic event started. Sean and I spending far too long actually repackaging a game, which Sean made the comment. He's like, man, I don't usually get to punch games. So this is quite fun. <laughs> so yeah, after a couple of hours of learning how to box the game, <laughs> I at least had familiarity with the concepts before the teach happened. Or the yeah, and I gotta say, <laughs> the, the book, the, they did a great job on this. Mind Clash Games did a great job on this box with a like rule book for how to pack it that actually was excellent, though overwhelming. I, I think, and, and the trades were excellent. Like they could sort it, except for one minor thing, it sorted things where you think they should go. So I still don't understand why those blocking tiles aren't in with the players, other than that one. So once we had everything sorted out and into proper containers, we went through a three-player game. Um, in this case, we just used the base game module, none of the expansions or future perfect or anything else. Though we, of course, use the exo certs because that makes the game for some reason. Um, I think it went great. Uh, this is one of my favorite games of all time. It's in my top five. Um, nothing about this play on the weekend change set. My only complaint is teaching it. I hate teaching this game because it's intimidating and scary and it sounds like there's all these options. And unfortunately, the first decisions you have to make in the game beside between picking which side of your leader to use 
which side of your board to use. And then once it starts, how many suits to power up and what to ask from the future. Those five decisions kind of require that you know the entire game. And I hate teaching it. It's not the kind of game where you can tell people, eh, just do something and see how it works. If that works in most adventure style games, but in a heavier Euro, it just doesn't work as well. So despite a bit of a rough teach, what do you think of an Akron? Well, I loved it. <laughs> uh, we played unsurprisingly extreme uh, with some yeah, minor, a couple things. minor things. Uh, and some things were learned during the play. But even so, it was a strongly themed sci-fi game with an amazing time travel mm -hmm. mechanic that just downright works. Now, personally, I'd be scared to buy it. As with all the various components and expansions and the sheer size, I mean, we are the, the Infinity Box is significantly bigger than Bloomhaven. Um, it seems like a lifestyle game. Uh, but as for playing it, if the opportunity and time arises, sign me up. Now, I remember one of the things you kept calling out, and you did do the thing that everyone does, where you didn't say the exact words, but basically said, yeah, this is simpler than I thought it would be. This is easier to learn than I thought. Everyone who plays it said, and Sean didn't say those exact words, <laughs> but he was just like, had that, oh, this isn't that bad, which is what everyone does. By about turn two, they're just like, oh, I'm just collecting these things to build these buildings, to give me more things, to do a thing, to do a thing. Um, and what we messed up, we did, we played extreme because we didn't shift over the buildings properly. Like what we played extreme wasn't huge, except we did mess up the fact that free actions didn't take your turn. We were going around the table and by free, I was thinking free didn't need a worker, but free actually means do a bunch in a row. Those were all we messed up. Now, one of the things that makes the game so play so well, though, is the iconography. Yeah, indeed. A lot of games could learn from this game. Because even when we looked at something and we weren't 100% certain and, ne and decided to check that rule book, our guesses were right <laughs> when we got to the rules. Uh, the wording might have been vaguely different and, and clarified it for us, but we had been basically right about what we guessed just by looking at the pictures on the cards. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem, if you can call it that, is how much yes. iconography there is. It is seriously overwhelming to a new player and so despite the game not being mechanically different as as we just said you know Difficult. not it, it's just not a hard game but it would be terrifying to someone who is new to hobby mm -hmm. gaming uh and the fact that it is difficult to teach only reinforces that despite that once you get into it and and, and get a little familiar it's just not that hard to play See, the thing is, what we need now is we need Sean back down before we all forget how to play again and we have to relearn it all. And then maybe I can actually try out one of the multiple expansions. So after Sean left, actually the night Sean left, I didn't feel like working. I decided to consider us still on vacation. So I actually sat down and read all of the supplementary expansions. And I got to say, there's some really cool stuff in there. The, the one in particular I think Sean would have liked is there's a module where you can send your one of your mechs on an adventure. And it very, you haven't played Caverna, but it very much reminded me of Caverna, where you send your dwarf on an adventure to see what you get. And there's two decks of cards where there's difficulty five and difficulty 10 adventures. And you pick which one you go on and you flip it and you see if your power equals the number on the card. And if you num beat the number on the card, you get something awesome. And if you fail, you lose something, but still gain something for going on. it. And this is where the leveling up your mechs is. So you can actually improve your mechs so they're better at adventures. Mm -hmm. And that adds a whole story element where it's you're leaving the capital. You're going out into the wilds on an adventure. And I'm like, oh, that sounds awesome. And it sounds like something you'd really dig. So that's, that's, that's my number one on the list of expansions to actually try next time. All right. Now, after this, we sat down and we're a little bit of brain burn. Like Anachrony is not a light game, despite... Again, the basic mechanics, the actions you take aren't that hard, but man, trying to figure out what building to make or how to get the right time travel or to change your focus or collect the right resources to build the right thing uh, can be quite a bit of burning in the brain. So we decided to swap and finish off the rest of the night playing lighter games, which we started with the game. Now, we recommend this one all the time, and I everyone knows my opinion on it and why I dig it, but this was your first time playing. What do you think of the game? So... This was a fun one. And, uh, you know, having experienced it once, I would be more than happy to play it again anytime. The first time you play at this, you look at your hand and you look at the 
the four stacks you have to build, and you can't imagine how you could possibly achieve this goal. And yet, lo and behold, we got down to a single card left after card. some finagling and wincing. Single card. That's really good. We almost won. Winning on the first place, Sean probably would have been done. I beat the game. <laughs> I never had to play again. So I'm actually kind of glad we were one card away. I'm, I'm not Tori. <laughs> yeah. I still really dig this. We had a pile that we got back into the 90s five times. Uh, that was the first time I've ever seen a deck go back up that many times. So that was awesome. I still, the game's awesome. Everyone should own the game. Now, after that, though, we were thinking of calling it a night, but then I spotted the mine. And I'm like, oh, I got to let Sean try the mine just to see how he feels about the two of them. Because everyone, uh, the, there are, there's a, a divide here of people who prefer the game and people who prefer the mine, not to mention the people who think the mine's a game and not. We're not going to get into that. So we decided to play the mind. We played out one round. Uh, we didn't get very far. Five, six, I think. Six. Yeah. Six. Yeah, I think we got to six or we lost on six. Yeah, we lost on six. We lost on six. Now, I dig the mine. Deanna hates it. Where do you stand? Uh, I've played it. <laughs> I can say that I've played it. It was amusing and fun. But that being said, I have no real interest in playing it again. It kind of just exhausted its fun in that one play, I feel like. So now if we're having a game night, it's New Year's and someone breaks it out. You're not going to refuse playing. Yeah, I'm not going to say no, but it's certainly I, I might suggest something else in case i go. might push them in that direction fair enough so we did wrap up the weekend with uh more plays of hellbringer gave it another shot after putting it aside because we were kind of like getting frustrated with the the rules and the rule questions and all the questions are so like you know what let's stop let's put it aside we'll come back to it before the weekend ends and see how it plays after we've all you know slept on it now, do you have anything you want to add about these games? Uh, I mean, really, the standout winner for the weekend was probably Anachrony, though the much lighter weight Alien Frontiers was a strong contender to take that title. Fair enough. Now, one more thing I thought of that could be amusing. So usually at the end of the Bellhop's Tabletop segment, you ask me, what do you have planned for the coming weeks? So I want to know, what do you have planned for your next trip down? Is there anything we played this weekend you absolutely want to play again? Or is there something we never got to that you wish we had? Uh, well, Terrible I'd like to give another try earlier in the night. <laughs> uh, and I'm down to play Anachrony anytime we can find the time and space. So. so one of the things I did confirm about that reading the rules is you cannot play five players. The game eventually has five factions, but you still can only play with four players which is actually an inaccuracy on one of the board game geek pages because i had prepped it thinking we could play this with tori and cat and it didn't work out that way so there is that one but now what i'm wondering is there any way for us to play anachrony online so now that i think about it this is a lot of what i like is the physicality of that game the, the warp chip handling and the, the the awesome metal especially with the kickstarter version right the awesome metal cubes and the loading your guys into their mecha to send them out so i i, I think a lot of that's going to be lost I have a feeling it's going to be like Tapestry. Like we, we play Tapestry on Board Game Marine all the time, but I still would much rather play the physical game with the nice landmarks and rolling the actual dice to get screwed whenever you invent because that's all that happens when you invent in that game anyway. Um, I would prefer to play it in person, but you know what? That's not going to be an option. So. so they do make their games available. They make their games available on Tabletopia, a number of them, uh, not okay. just Anachrony. I'm uh, assuming subscription. Um, you know what? I, it's it's hard to tell with Tabletopia until you start clicking through things. Um, I, it didn't scream subscription, but maybe maybe the base game isn't subscription. But the because uh, there's some different games that have some of the other expansions mm -hmm. uh, need them. Uh, there are multiple versions on TTS, uh, including the Infinity Box, though. I you have with TTS, you kind of have to go through and try them to see mm -hmm. what works and what doesn't, and which has better automation and development. Um, so it's a, it's a struggle, but there are, are versions available out there. This is one, like, I don't even know how much scripting you would need. Like, it would be nice if there was like, especially waking up your people, right? Those should shift over automatically. And the end of the round, there should be like a collect all my stuff and yeah, it auto you know, sorts flip, them. Flip your next, flip, flip the next uh, mega project yeah. and move all the, to the tiles for the, uh, stuff batteries. like that would be nice, but I could see this one playing without any of that. Yeah. It would probably work. All right, 13 games. 
Not bad at all. <laughs> yeah, that's it for my thoughts on 13 new to me games I got to try over the May 2 4 weekend. All right, we're here to answer your gaming and game night questions. If you got a question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or email me at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Well, today we're reviewing a mashup of card game and drinking game, Drinking Quest Six Pack. Thank you, Jason Anarchy Games, for sending us a copy of this unique dungeon crawler to check out. The Drinking Quest series of games was designed and written by Jason Anarchy, starting with Drinking Quest way back in 2011. This was followed by five more Drinking Quest games, all of which were self-published by Jason's company, Jason Anarchy Games. Now, Drinking Quest Six Pack combines all six previous games, but features updated artwork, minor rule tweaks, and some awesome extra stuff like rules for boss battles, all in one deluxe box. Now, Drinking Quest has featured artwork from 14 different artists over its various editions, but that's a little more than I have time to list here. So you definitely get a lot in this box, no argument there. If this is the sort of game you're looking for, then the six pack has all the content you'd need for plenty mm -hmm. of play. Now, Drinking Quest is designed for two to four players with optional rules to play with more. I particularly like the designated GM rule for this. Playing through a full adventure can take an hour, possibly even two, depending on how off track you get, but you also have the option to just play through one or two quests at a time instead of doing a full adventure. Now, the MSRP for this deluxe Drinking Quest set is $59.99 US, and can currently be purchased directly from Jason Anarchy Games, but should be showing up in online and physical stores soon. Now, playing time may also be impacted by how much drinking is or isn't going on as well. So Drinking Quest 6-pack features six different adventures, each split into four separate quests, all represented by cards. You create your character, then draw cards to see what happens to you. Encounters are a mix of one-on-one -on -one combat and challenges to overcome, all of which have a pretty slapstick, ridiculous theme fitting into the fact that this is a drinking game after all. Now, between encounters, you can spend your gold to upgrade your equipment. Once you get through all the quests, the party teams up to face a boss monster. If at any point you falter on your quest, don't worry, there's no permadeath here. Resurrection can be found at the bottom of your mug after a hearty chug. So to check out the newly improved card layout, new character sheets, and other upgraded components in this deluxe version of Drinking Quest, check out our Drinking Quest six-pack unboxing video on YouTube. Now with this new version of Drinking Quest, you get a nice solid box and a cool comic-themed sleeve. The box lid is held shut by a magnetic flap. Under that, you're going to find a silky two-sided map that serves no purpose other than being kind of cool. Uh, the rules are short and very clear. The box insert works great for organizing everything, and the card quality is good. You also get a pad of character sheets, some dice, and a metal coin. The quality here is impressive, and I have no complaints about it quality-wise at all. Well, now that we have a good idea of what you get in this new deluxe Drinking Quest box set, how about you give us an overview of play? All right, all players select a character and grab the special drink card for that character. Players then fill out a character sheet listing their name, the character's name, the character's maximum hit points, attack dice, defense rating, and the numbers for the character's four saving throws. These saving throws are self-worth, smarts, tolerance, and sexual prowess. The character sheet also has spots to track current hit points, experience, gold, weapons, armor, items, etc. Now, I want to point out here that the special drinks don't have real-world equivalents. You can't mix yourself up a drink based off of your characters unless you happen to be a creative mixologist yourself. Something I totally think is a missed opportunity that should be added in future games. If I'm going to have uh, two fists with names, I want to be able to actually have a drink named that at the same time. Now, once you've all got characters, you're going to pick an adventure to take part in. Uh, though again, there are six in this box. You're going to take the four quest decks for that adventure, separate them out, and shuffle them. Someone's going to read the description in the back of the book for the first quest, and the game starts. Now, playing the game is dead simple. You flip over one card from the appropriate deck, read it, and act on it. These cards come in two types. There's either monsters or events. Events have flavor text, then list a saving throw you have to check. 
do this, you roll all the dice and compare them to your saving throw. If you get equal to or under your saving throw, you read the success part of the card. And well, if you fail, you read the fail part of the card. The dice are oddly 1d4, 1d6, and 1dh8. Which, for those math folks out there, the average of the bell curve is 10 and 11 at the top. Uh, now, the stats are generally above and below the peak of the bell curve. So you're getting 14s and 8s rather than all coming in around 10 and 11. Now, once you draw a monster, you're going to go into a one-on-one -on -one battle to the death where the player on your left will roll for the monster. A D6 is rolled for initiative, with ties going to the hero. Then combat just becomes a matter of rolling damage back and forth until someone's dead. There's no two hit, there's no armor class to worry about or anything like that. If a monster wins, your hero's dead. But remember, all you got to do is chug the rest of your drink and you'll come back with full health. No, nope, half health if you can't finish the chug. Now, in order to stop people from getting too wasted, after you've chugged once, for the rest of that quest, you only have to take three sips to resurrect. Now, if you do win the combat, you're going to get gold and XP that's listed on the bottom of the card. That's it. You now know pretty much all there is to know about playing the game. That's pretty much it for mechanics. Now, between each card draw, players have a chance to spend that gold they've earned. They can go to the shop. There's a shop board that lists a bunch of weapons, armor, and special items like beers that restore health, potions to give rerolls, and things like the bracelet of bouncer ability that gives you a boost to all your saving throws. Some items like weapons are class specific, but the armor and healing are universal. Now quests are finished when the deck runs out. After you get to the bottom of the deck, you completed that quest. After you finish the fourth quest in an adventure, you will reach the boss monster. You shuffle up the boss monster deck, and draw a card. Here, everyone has to fight the same monster. Player who deals the killing blow gets to hand out the loot to the other players, and that loot will include some silly booby prizes as well as gold XP and other things. Simple and straightforward. Exactly what you need when there might be inebriation involved. Now, while all this is going on, we come back to those signature drinks. This is a special ability that you can use to break the rules. These include things like the bartendress dancing for tips and thus increasing her gold rewards, or the dwarf heading people, headbutting people in the groin for automatic damage. After the boss is defeated, the player with the most XP wins. Ties are broken by the number of chugs the tied players had to take, with the least chugs winning the game. Now that everyone has a good idea of how to play Drinking Quest, it's time to get into our thoughts on this drinking game. So Drinking Quest 6-pack, this new combined set, is my first experience with Drinking Quest. Now, I do remember hearing about this game back on G+, back in like 2010, 2011. I guess the idea of a role-playing game that included drinking sounded interesting, but just wasn't something I was interested in with the group I was playing with. And I never really looked beyond the surface to see exactly what Drinking Quest was about, and I've got to say I was surprised once I did finally get to try this game. Now I know both what it is and what it isn't. So what it is, is a silly experience and a way to add some fun to a night of drinking. Now, what it isn't is a role-playing game in any but the most superficial ways. While Drinking Quest has RPG elements, it's not a role-playing game. Yes, you choose a character, but you don't even take on a role. You don't play that character. It just gives you a bunch of numbers that you need when you draw cards. You don't even get to name your own character. There's no evolving story or branching paths or really any decisions to make. The story is going to be the same every time, and the number of actual choices you get to make in the game is extremely limited. The only real options you get, besides picking a character, is what to spend your money on and when to use that special drink special ability. This is essentially a roll and move that has, thankfully, done away with the board. Now, the gameplay here is pretty much scripted, and some of the players I tried it with found the game to be rather boring because of this. As the game boils down to flip a card, read some amusing text, then roll some dice. Rinse and repeat till you finish the adventure. My group found this rather disappointing overall. We were just expecting more from Drinking Quest, especially more RPG elements. Indeed, when you get a nice, meaty box of cards and components, we, perhaps mistakenly, are expecting a bit more game, more choice, or interaction. Now, all of this said, I don't want to totally disparage this game. We did have some fun playing Drinking Quest for what it is, right? A drinking game with some RPG elements. As the alternative to a, you know, silly drinking game, like every time Picard says, make it so, take a drink, 
I think this is going to be more fun than that particular Star Trek meme. Though I will say most TV show or movie based drinking games actually have a bit more nuance in the drinking part of the game. Yeah, here you're either pounding or you're taking three sips and that's it. Now the theme is good. Uh, the puns are painful as they should be. And RPG fans are going to appreciate some of the inside jokes. Uh, the artwork fits the theme and the content, while somewhat juvenile, also fits the style of game. Yes, one of the character saving throw stats is sexual prowess. And yes, there are some adult situations to go along with this, and some of which I wouldn't even necessarily call consensual, but I didn't find this to be outright offensive, mostly because this wasn't a role-playing game. It's not like you're taking on the role of these characters. You just got to make sure with your group, you know what you're in for when you sit down to play. Now, one thing I will note as for problematic content is that the cards did become more progressive and more diverse with less potentially offensive content with each new edition of the game. For example, in the first adventure, the original Jake and Quest, all of the sexual prowess checks involved women, while that's not the case in the later adventures. The designers appear to have certainly learned and improved, but know that this means Quest 1 may have more potential to offend some players. Now, one of the things I did appreciate that is included in Drinking Quest is talk about drinking responsibility, or sorry, drinking responsibly, and making sure that everyone knows how they're getting home before the game starts. There's a nice good paragraph on this. There are even some variant rules for playing with adult, but without adult beverages, which I do appreciate. You could, of course, sit down and play this game completely sober with a sober group with no plan on drinking. So I think you'd be kind of missing the point entirely. If what you want is a silly dungeon crawl game without the drinking, I think there's better choices out there. Now that we, under now we understand that encouraging drinking particularly any drinking that may be considered reckless, is very problematic. And there may be legal issues at work in such a game being published. That said, I really wanted more of a drinking game in this. As it stands, you chug when you die, and sip, or three sips, if you die again, that quest. You can give someone a chug token that gets traded around, and every time whoever receives it has to take a chug, but there's no drinking rules for failing a check or really any of the various other nuanced drinking aspects that I recalled from college drinking game days. If I'm deliberately choosing to play a drinking game, there's a good chance that I'm doing so to drink. And this game really doesn't seem to actually help all that much with that. But looking at Drinking Quest as it stands, there's some improvements I would love to see in future Drinking Quest games, something to just make it more gamified. Uh, one of the things I like about drinking games, some of that nuance Sean's talking about, is I want a game that gets more difficult the more you drink. Uh, that's to me, is the, the key aspect of a drinking game is that it gets harder once you get a little inebriated, which is why I love playing dexterity games when I'm imbibed. But you're not going to find any of that increased difficulty based on your capacity here in this game. Now, I would also, of course, like more decision points in the quests, like having some choices to make would not only increase the, the decision space, but would also increase the replayability and make it feel more like a full role-playing game. As it stands, after playing an adventure with four players, you'll have seen all the cards and you're going to know what to expect every future play. Plus, well, the jokes are funny the first time around, and there was lots of laughing. I have a feeling they're going to get a lot less amusing when you see them over and over and over again. Indeed, once you, uh, <clears throat> once you know the quirks and callbacks, just changing the order they arrive in is of minimal benefit. Yeah. And also, an improvement I would like is honestly to go back to the old character sheets in a way. Uh, the new character sheets look great. They're very visually appealing, but the imagery on them is rather dark and it's hard to see what you've actually written. I would have liked it more if the spots you write on were blank or faded more at least. We actually found in almost every game we played that people were using the back of the character sheets to actually track their damage and hit points instead of the front of the sheet. Indeed, the icons where you're expected to write in pencil make it very difficult to read in anything short of bright daylight. Now as well, I would have greatly appreciated having something to track the amount of damage that's been done to a monster. Having to remember how much health a mob has left every turn isn't always easy, especially when everyone's chatting and socializing. Now, this is one aspect of the game that does get harder the more you drink, but I don't think that's meant to be part of the game. Now, maybe if you added a rule where if you forget your target's health, it goes back to full health and you have to drink, 
but that's not part of the existing rules. Luckily, with a group, one person can track the monster health for you, but it still has to be done. It still has to be tracked somehow. Now, finally, the other thing I would like is a second set of dice. That just would have been a nice to have. I, I, it's not necessary. I own a lot of dice. It's not a big problem. But I just got annoyed having to pass the dice back and forth during combat, especially when you and the monster have the exact same die to attack. I did five. Here you go. I did this. Here you go. Just having two sets, one for that player on your left would have been nice. So overall, I tried four different adventures and drinking quests, split over a couple different game nights and a few different groups, and it went over much better with one specific group of players. This honestly isn't a game that's going to appeal to everyone, but for those people it does appeal to, I think they're going to really enjoy it. And I think most of us know uh, who in our own group of friends would dig a game like Drinking Quest, and with that group, it's going to be a ton of fun. No, uh, with most, if not all games, the right people can make or break your experience. Now, if you're looking to add a bit of adventure to a night of drinking with friends, I don't think you can go wrong playing around a drinking quest, as long as everyone's cool with the content and what the game's about. Games of drinking quests can lead to a lot of laughs and quite a bit of drinking as well, especially with it being a full-on chug. Potentially, what I figured it out, you could do it like six times a night if you do chug everything and that coin goes in. Plus, there were a couple cards I had you chug as well. So it, that could be quite heavy. Now, what I don't see is any reason for a group of non gamers to really want to pick this up. Sorry, not non gamers, non drinkers. Sorry. I don't really see any reason for a group of non drinkers would want to pick this up, which makes sense. It's a drinking game, it is primarily a drinking game and a card game secondarily. As for mixed groups, you may be interested in this, uh, especially if you have one. If you have one player who doesn't drink or one, one player of the group who's your designated driver, I think it'd be great because the designated GM rule has that one player playing the monsters and the cards, and that's where you can, might actually get some real role-playing in. If you've got someone who has some GM chops, they can actually make it sound a little more interesting than just the text on the cards, and I think it would work great for this. Now, if you're looking for a new role-playing game or a new fantasy game to play when you're drinking, I think you're better off taking the drinking resurrection rules from Drinking Quest and porting them over to a high fatality role-playing game. Like I can totally say taking the basic concept from this and throwing it into a Dungeon Crawl Classics funnel. I think that could be a great game night. Could also be alcohol poisoning, but you know, that's a... <laughs> well, you, you only start with four to six characters. So again, you're looking at four to six drinks. Well, it depends how many times you resurrect each one, I guess. <laughs> Um, as for us, I plan to keep this on my shelf. I think it's going to prove popular on the right game nights with the right people. Um, once things return to normal, I plan on having a gaming in the new year party again, and this will be a good one to pull out late in the night when people are kind of borderline after the kids are gone to bed, but before people have got too silly. Well, that's it for our review of the Drinking Quest six pack, a combination of all six previous Drinking Quest games in a new deluxe boxed set. For a more detailed look at this drinking game, check out the review over at tabletopbellhop.com. Now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests. Our Patreon backers, we greatly appreciate their support. Jeff Seuss. Thanks, Jeff. We were thinking about you while we were at Red Lantern Brewing. Kevin Brewing Renault. Coffee Co? What, roasters. Coffee roasters. Kevin Renault. Thanks, Tech. Timothy Smith, Tim, I can't talk anymore. I was drinking during the drinking quest review. I actually wasn't. Timothy Smith, thanks, Timothy. Dad and Tori, it was great getting to game with you again. William Fisher, thank you. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us at tabletopbellhop.com, all over the web as Tabletop Bellhop, one word, and on your podcatcher of choice under Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. Uh, show your support for our show at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop and sign up for awesome bonus content, including hours of bonus audio and access to our Discord channel. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. Thank you, lobbyists, for joining us. And I invite you to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And game, game on. on.